Roughing It by Mark Twain. Two, Calvin H. Higby of California, an honest man, a genial comrade, and a steadfast friend. This book is inscribed by the author in memory of the curious time when we two were millionaires for 10 days. Perfatory. This book is merely a personal narrative and not a pretentious history or a philosophical dissertation. It is a record of several years of variegated vagabundizing and its object is rather to help the resting reader while away an idle hour than afflict him with metaphysics or goad him with science. Still, there is information in the volume, information concerning an interesting episode in the history of the Far West about which no books have been written by persons who were on the ground in person and saw the happenings of the time with their own eyes. I allude to the rise, growth, and culmination of the silver mining fever in Nevada, a curious episode in some respects, the only one of its peculiar kind that has occurred in the land, and the only one, indeed, that is likely to occur in it. Yes, take it all around. There is quite a good deal of information in the book. I regret this very much, but, it really, but really it could not be helped. Information appears to stew out of me naturally, like a pr precious otar of roses out of the otter. Sometimes it has seemed to me that I would give worlds if I could retain my facts, but it cannot be. The more I call up the sources and the tighter I get, the more I leak wisdom. Therefore, I can only claim indulgence at the hands of the reader, not justification, the author. Chapter one. My brother appointed secretary of Nevada. I envy his prospective adventures. Am appointed private secretary under him. My contentment complete. Packed in one hour, dreams and visions, on the Missouri River, a bully boat. My brother had just been appointed Secretary of Nevada Territory, an office of such majesty that it concentrated in itself the duties and dignities of Treasurer, Comptroller, Secretary of State, and Acting Governor in the Governor's absence. A salary of $1,800 a year in the title of Mr. Secretary gave to the great position an air of wild and imposing grandeur. I was young and ignorant, and I envied my brother. I coveted his distinction and his financial splendor, but particularly and especially the long, strange journey he was going to make and the curious new world he was going to explore. He was going to travel. I never had been far away from home, and that word, travel, had a seductive charm for me. Pretty soon he would be hundreds and hundreds of miles away on the great plains and deserts and among the mountains of the far west and would see buffaloes and Indians and prairie dogs and antelopes and have all kinds of adventures and maybe get hanged or scalped and have ever such a fine time and write home and tell us all about it and be a hero. And he would see the gold mines and the silver mines and maybe go about of an afternoon when his work was done and pick up two or three pailfuls of shining slugs and nuggets of gold and silver on the hillside. And by and by he would become very rich and return home by sea and be able to talk as calmly about San Francisco and the ocean and the isthmus as if it was nothing of any consequence to have seen these, those marvels face to face. What I suffered in contemplating his happiness pen cannot describe. And so, and so when he offered me in cold blood the sublime position of private secretary under him, it appeared to me that the heavens and the earth passed away and the firmament was rolled together as a scroll. I had nothing more to desire. My contentment was complete. At the end of an hour or two I was ready for the journey. Not much packing up was necessary because we were going in the overland stage 
from the Missouri frontier to Nevada, and passengers were only allowed a small quantity of baggage apiece. There was no Pacific Railroad in those fine times of 10 or 12 years ago, not a single rail of it. I only proposed to stay in Nevada three months. I had no thought of staying longer than that. I meant to see all I could that was new and strange, and then hurry home to business. I little thought that I would not see the end of that three-month pleasure excursion for six or seven uncommonly long years. I dreamed all night about Indians, deserts, and silver bars, and in due time, next day, we took shipping at the St. Louis Wharf on board a steamboat bound up the, Missis the Missouri River. We were six days going from St. Louis to St. Joe, a trip that was so dull and sleepy and eventless that it has left no more impression on my memory than if its duration had been six minutes instead of that many days. No record is left in my mind now concerning it, but a confused jumble of savage-looking snags which we deliberately walked over with one wheel or the other, and of reefs which we butted and butted and then retired from and climbed over in some softer place, and of sandbars which we roosted on occasionally and rested, and then got out our crutches and sparred over. In fact, the boat might almost as well have gone to St. Joe by land, for she was walking most of the time anyhow, climbing over reefs and clambering over snags patiently and laboriously all day long. The captain said she was a bully boat, and all she wanted was more shear and a bigger wheel. I thought she wanted a pair of stilts, but I had the deep sagacity not to say so. anyhow, climbing over reefs and clambering over snags patiently and laboriously all day long. The captain said she was a bully boat, and all she wanted was more shear and a bigger wheel. I thought she wanted a pair of stilts, but I had the deep sagacity not to say so. Chapter 2 Arrive at St. Joseph. Only 25 pounds baggage allowed. Farewell to kid gloves and dress coats. Armed to the teeth. The Allen. A cheerful weapon. Persuaded to buy a mule. Schedule of luxuries. We leave the States. Our coach. Mails for the Indians. Between a wink and an earthquake. A modern sphinx and how she entertained us. A sociable heifer. The first thing we did on that glad evening that landed us at St. Joseph was to hunt up the stage office and pay $150 apiece for tickets per overland coach to Carson City, Nevada. The next morning, bright and early, we took a hasty breakfast and hurried to the starting place. Then an inconvenience presented itself which we had not properly appreciated before, namely, that one cannot make a heavy traveling trunk stand for 25 pounds of baggage because it weighs a good deal more. But that was all we could take, 25 pounds each. So we had to snatch our trunks open and make a selection in a good deal of hurry. We put our lawful 25 pounds apiece all in one valise and shipped the trunks back to St. Louis again. It was a sad parting, for now we had no swallowtail coats and white kid gloves to wear at Pawnee receptions in the Rocky Mountains, and no stovepipe hats, nor patent leather boots, nor anything else necessary to make life calm and peaceful. We were reduced to a war footing. Each of us put on a rough, heavy suit of clothing, woolen army shirt and stogey boots included and into the valleys we crowded a few white shirts, some underclothing, and such things. My brother, the secretary, took along about four pounds of United States statutes and six pounds of unabridged dictionary, for we did not know, 
poor innocents. But such things could be bought in San Francisco on one day and received in Carson City the next. I was armed to the teeth with a pitiful little Smith & Wesson seven-shooter, which carried a ball like a homeopathic pill, and it took the whole seven to make a dose for an adult. But I thought it was grand. It appeared to me to be a dangerous weapon. It only had one fault. You could not hit anything with it. One day, our conductors practiced a while on a cow with it, and as long as she stood still and behaved herself, she was safe. But as soon as she went to moving about and he got to shooting at other things, she came to grief. The secretary had a small-sized Colt's revolver strapped around him for protection against the Indians and to guard against accidents, he carried it uncapped. Mr. George Bemis was dismally formidable. George Bemis was our fellow traveler. We had never seen him before. He wore in his belt an old original Allen revolver, such as irreverent people called a pepper box. Simply drawing the trigger back, cocked and fired the pistol. As the trigger came back, the hammer would begin to rise and the barrel to turn over, and presently down would drop the hammer, and away would speed the ball. To aim along the turning barrel and hit the thing aimed at was a feat which was probably never done with an Allen in the world. But George's was a reliable weapon, nevertheless, because as one of the stage drivers afterwards said, if she didn't get what she went after, she would fetch something else. And so she did. She went after a deuce of spades nailed against a tree once and fetched a mule standing about 30 yards to the left of them. Bemis did not want the mule, but the owner came out with a double-barreled shotgun and persuaded him to buy it anyhow. It was a cheerful weapon, the Allen. <clears throat> Sometimes all its six barrels would go off at once, and then there was no safe place in all the region ab round about but behind it. We took two or three blankets for protection against frosty weather in the mountains. In the matter of luxuries, we were modest. We took none along but some pipes and five pounds of smoking tobacco. We had two large canteens to carry water in between stations on the plains, and we also took with us a little shot bag of silver coin for daily expenses in the way of breakfasts and dinners. By eight o'clock, everything was ready and we were on the other side of the river. We jumped into the stage, the driver cracked his whip and we bowled away and left the states behind us. It was a superb summer morning and all the landscape was brilliant with sunshine. There was a freshness and breeziness too and an exhilarating sense of emancipation from all sorts of cares and responsibilities that almost made us feel that the years we had spent in the close hot city toiling and slaving had been wasted and thrown away. We were spinning along through Kansas, and in the course of an hour and a half, we were fairly abroad on the Great Plains. Just here the land was rolling, a grand sweep of regular elevations and depressions as far as the eye could reach, like the stately heave and swell of the ocean's bosom after a storm. And everywhere were cornfields accenting the squares of deeper green, this limitless expanse of grassy land. But presently, this sea upon dry ground was to lose its rolling character and stretch away for 700 miles.